and welcome to episode 11 of Hardcore Gaming 101's Top 47,858 Games of All Time podcast, where we objectively and definitively rank the games you nominate. My name is Snarboo, and Sussex County, Delaware residents born between 1936 and 1966 are in for a big surprise. My panelists are... I'm Vise the Bold. I'm Carl. And Satanga, uh, I'll form the legs. On this podcast, we have three rules, and only three rules. Canonus numero ena. All rankings are final, official, and scientifically accurate. Canonus numero vio. You can nominate three games at a time via Twitter by hitting us up at GC9X. Canonus numero tria. You can nominate games that have already been nominated, but don't nominate games we've already ranked. By the way, you can always check the master list for yourself. Check it out at bit.ly forward slash 47k games. For those wondering why Xerxes isn't on this podcast, well, let's just say um, we've hit a bit of a snag, and that snag being a case of invasion of the body snatchers. Fortunately, we had to put him down before his time, but, you know, it, it happens when you get your soul replaced by an evil yeah. alien. Uh, it, the same pod. thing happens to all replicants, let's be honest. <laughs> wow, I can't believe you actually did that. We're not even starting on the... Uh, but yeah, I was just... Worry, guys, Blade Runner 2 is coming out soon. Keep watching <laughs> those really? cinemas. Yeah, have it's, it's have you ever movie. seen Soldier with Kurt Russell? It, it's, yes. Uh, it's canon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Well, in, in the case in the case of Xerxes, uh, his head was messily grafted onto a dog's body. Some really really nasty stuff there. But you know, he... he's a cortex reaver now. First up tonight is Robotron 2084, which was nominated by at Dot Gobblers, and was developed by VidKids for I believe was it Midway or Midway? Yeah, okay, that's what I thought, and it was published in 1982 for the arcade. Wait, it wasn't. Technically Midway, though. That was Williams Electronics. I, I mean, the, the uh, whole Williams-Midway oh, okay. relation gets kind of confusing. Yeah. Especially once you factor in balance. Mess, so. Yeah, definitely. What's most important, it was developed by a company named VidKids. Uh, that's kids with a Z, so you know they're really hardcore. Yeah, uh, one of the VidKids in question is Eugene Jarvis. Uh, all yes. The, who, uh, with this lesser-known part partner, Larry DeMar, they already had a big hit in the arcades with Defender. And, yeah. uh, and Sequel you, Stargate. Eugene Jarvis is still making arcade t- games today. In fact, he he pretty much has the only successful uh, U.S. arcade manufacturer uh, called Rolf Thrills, and they're pretty much in every movie theater in wow. the country. Oh man, that's uh, awesome. and every truck stop with uh, like their Fast and Furious games. Yeah, you you would recognize their games, which is really interesting. Um, I actually read an interview uh, with Eugene because he still you know makes. Uh, games are still involved in the process where he's like, you know, he, he, he's smart about it. He says, like, look, we make big, you know, basically make big stupid machine things because you can't have a giant machine in your house. Like, that's what we make now because you can't do that in your house. So, you know, they know what they're doing. They're pretty good. They'll probably- His distribution channels must be, like, very... Um- very very successful because he, he he gets them out there and he, he has all kinds of really good licenses like terminator he makes terminator and alien games um and he basically makes the spiritual successors of the cruising games with the uh with the fast and furious <laughs> um it's ve- very much a, a visual descendant of uh defender it has a very much much a similar look in that it kind of looks like a vector game even though it isn't um, it has kind of uh, it has those rainbow style against uh, a black background, yeah, it, which it's... gives it a really nice psychedelic look. It looks really good on that sort of phosphor screen that they used in the arcades in like 1982. It doesn't look sure. as great when you pump it through like an uh, LCD sort of screen because it doesn't have that same phosphorus glow. Like it yeah, looks it has really pop. fantastic. You um, know, ha- if you get to it play it pop. in an arcade. Yeah, For and sure. yeah, it's got this cacophony of sound that the an arcade game like this should have, where it's just like blip 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 yeah. yeah, shots and stuff. <laughs> yeah, for and 19... everything explodes. Yeah, for nineteen eighty two, the these arcade visuals were like what we consider like the the the, the crisis series today. It is r- really impressive stuff. Like mo- most people would see it nowadays, and uh, probably wouldn't really think much to say, but. Really, this looked better than almost anything back in the golden era of arcade gaming. 
well, you've got so many enemies on screen, it's insane. Oh, yeah, and it barely, and it rarely ever slows down, too, uh, no matter... Once you get into the later waves. I mean, I, I'm observing this video right now that apparently goes up to wave 75, and it just does not relent. <laughs> it's, yeah, so it's, the way yeah, the game a... works is, it is a uh, wave-based thing. You get a single screen full of uh, enemies to shoot and civilians to collect, um... Civilians are basically bonus points, if I remember correctly. You have to clear the screen of robots, and the it level, level ends instantly once you've defeated all the robots, even if there's humans left. Yep. Um, uh, because the plot is some ridiculous thing, like you're rescuing a cloned family across, like, time with, like, with the kidnap that have been kidnapped by robots is kind of like the plot. Um, yeah, I know. robots are definitely taking over. It's definitely, the, like, the plot of Terminator before Terminator was a thing. Um, I might add that this is a, a direct descendant uh, in design, from Berserk, uh, Stern's classic from 1980, uh, which was not dual stick, by the way, the major innovation for this game. Um, well, Robotron based- is often considered the first one. We know it's not because we mentioned last podcast uh, of a different um, twin sticker, but this is often seen as the first one that people really know. It's probably yeah. the, what you'd call the canonical one, or the uh, I guess the uh, Ur example because yeah. of the way it works. Like the the only other uh, game of this time. I mean, there were quite a few uh, twin stick shooters from the '80s and I think even into the '90s. But the only ones that I can immediately name would be Robotron 2084 and Smash TV, which Eugene Jarvis also made. It's sort of like the sequel yeah. in a way. Smash TV is very much uh, a, a spiritual successor to this game, and uh, I personally believe to be a much better game. Uh, that, that's just my thought. I think the pacing's a lot better, and there's also more to do. I really like the, the prize collecting in that game, um, but this game has yeah. its charms, that's for sure. What was this game up against in 82? Um if we're going to consider it against the other sort of games of the time, I meant given the, how fast it was, how colorful, you know, the unique uh, dual stick control scheme. Um, well, I, I can give you a quick rundown, just typing best video games 1982, uh, courtesy of Google.com. Uh, visit them for all <laughs> your Google needs. Um, uh, Frenzy came out, Berserk's sequel, uh, uh, yeah. same year. I do uh, think that compared to Berserk, uh, Robotron kind of leaves it in the dust. The twin sticks yes. makes a huge difference um, in playability. I personally like Frenzy better, but it's a slower-paced game, for sure. The uh, video games from 1982 it was up against includes uh, Dig Dug, Burger Time, Qbert, Donkey Kong Jr., Mr. Do, Joust, uh, Zaxxon, Pole Position, uh, Jungle Hunt, and uh, several Atari games. Uh, Pitfall, yay, E.T., boo. I I think what you find interesting here is, uh, even in 82, you're starting to see, uh, you know, like sort of a massive Japanese influx of uh, really, like, that's when their games were really starting to dominate the Oh, scene, yeah, Xevious was this sure. era as well. Yeah, Namco was definitely gaining prominence around this time. And Konami. Oh, yeah, wasn't Time Pilot 1982 also? Uh, Scramble was uh, 1981. You have Super Cobra with its sequel. Um, you have Puyan, uh, like I mentioned before. Yeah, you have quite some good ones. You have, Stern's also releasing Rescue, which I personally like, but it's little known. There's some there's some really good titles. There's a this lot time. of little known games from the early '80s because most of them people don't really remember or care about because half, half the games that were released in the '80s were like arcade exclusives that only people who were in arcades in like 1982 really played. So oh yeah, one more I found that's uh, pers- one more I found's personal favorite is Satan's Hollow. Yeah, oh, that's, that's a, a good, good one. one. Yeah, it's like super a really famous. good Galaga game. Yeah, Galaga it, style game. Yeah, it's like Galaga meets uh, Judeo-Christian um, mythology. So yeah, we've got a uh, got Robotron. Um, it's one of those games we have that doesn't really need an introduction. It's been part of common gaming lexicon for literally since yeah, its release, could, basically. You've you've basically been able to buy a a version of it for a very long time, and with not with no uh, like interruptions in service, pretty much. It, it, it's it's a classic. Uh, it even has sequels. Uh, it even has direct sequels on the PlayStation and uh, N sixty four. But I think it's a very like Defender. Defender is a very 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 difficult game. And uh, this game has a simpler setup, which I give to its credit. That's a, it's a really good game to easily understand. Um, well, it, it's with, helped a lot by the fact that the control scheme is not like 18 different buttons that you have to exactly. memorize. 
Exactly. The barrier to entry is a lot lower than than Defender in that case because it's just a bunch of buttons, um, kind of like asteroids, but worse. It is a really difficult game. Once you get past like the third screen, it starts murdering you. Yeah. Well, this game doesn't have credits. Uh, not credit. Yeah, it doesn't have continue. Sorry. Like you, you get one chance. You get to. Uh, you can earn extra lives, and it's very generous with the extra lives. Yes. But it, it cranks it up to eleven. Um, you know, it's, it's it's a game. You know, you would you know you would turn on some canvas to drop some speed, um, and then you would play Robotron all night. That's a uh, you know, that's your 82 experience, like, shaking from the adrenaline of this sort of game. It's a real I, thrill rush. I almost want to say it's too much at some times, though. I, I could I, definitely I, say it'd be too much for someone, for sure. I particularly like that the game has a lot of varied enemy types that do a lot of different things. Like, you have enemies that are indestructible in it. Yes. I, I really like the um, the robots that spawn other robots. Um, I've always liked the uh, the brain guys. I think the ones that convert brain people. Guys look into, cool. I, I like how they're the, really not. I do like how you specifically get thrown a brain wave every five waves. It makes it feel like a boss stage almost. And um, now the brains are pretty nefarious. I mean, they convert uh, innocence into projectiles. So yeah, it's it's a really nice. You, like I love that uh, inclusion. I and mean, that is kind of like a defender ish thing. It's like an extension of defender where. You know, you've got, like, NPCs. It's the 1982 game where you have NPCs that actually do something functional other than yeah. be collectibles, which is really cool. Uh, this game, I just will say, it's uh, it's not infinite in the sense that the waves don't change. There's 40 waves that are all, yeah, hand, unique, handmade, whatever. And then it loops back to 21 and, like, goes up to 40 again and back to 21. And so the first 20, you'll only ever play once if you can get past that. But if you can beat 40 stages, you've basically beaten the entire game. Uh, this well, game one, one complaint I would say about this game that does make it kind of a bit more difficult is it is sometimes hard to actually see enemies, especially the pulsing, um, like, spawning fields. They can be really hard to see in, like, mm-hmm. a microsecond. And you've got the uh, weird glowing not pickups that are like mines and stuff those can be really hard to not collect um you know when when you see these things because they look like power-ups and your brain is just so wired into collecting things like i mean if you haven't played robotron you probably have played like geometry wars and that sort of thing like these games are all basically robotron but different like that's they've been making them crimson land you know a lot of the games choose to remove the civilian element interestingly they remove the civilians, and they tend to introduce a power-up or two is generally what a Robotron clone will do. Which I think well, actually um, is, is weakness, um, personally. Ge- Geometry Rewards um, evolved to have collectibles, and they, they aren't like civilians uh, necessarily, but the geomes can be kind of seen as that, because you have, to, you have to manage killing guys versus your reward of collecting. So, um, in, in, in some ways, it kind of grew to having that element when the original uh, Geometry Wars as an Easter egg in uh, in uh, Project Gotham Racing never had. The the later games uh, certainly added that as a multiplier and also as a way to uh, to beat a lot of the challenges uh, later on. Um, um, you know, all let's, that let's, unless cool. someone has something else to add, I'm going to say rank it because, um, you know, mm-hmm. we don't get too, too sidetracked on well, everything else. I actually did have a question because we mentioned yes. the civilians. They, they kind of move around to kind of do their own thing. Is this one of the earlier examples of what we would call in a modern parlance a risk reward system like the sort of thing you see in a roguelite or that sort of thing? It's it's a bit tricky because you only get score for it, which I believe does increase your chance of getting an extra life. But it's. Um, it's not a huge, uh, you know, difference. There is an element of, of course, the brains can touch civilians and, and change them to threats for you. So there is certainly, uh, it's more resource management, I think, like yeah. whether whether it's worth killing an enemy or getting a civilian. Um, it's not it's not enough of a sort of risk-reward element, I think. It's just it's a bit of, like, resource management. Okay. Um, um, but it's not... You know, I really yeah, am. It's a, it's oh, definitely okay. an improvement over Berserk, which didn't uh, was just features attacking robots in it. So, not um, that I don't like Berserk, I do genuinely like Berserk as well. And Berserk, it. same. Berserk has killed so many people. You know what a great game. <laughs> yep. If I could have, if I could have any arcade cabinet, Robotron would definitely be up there in terms of what I would pick because um, yep. it's just 
I, I'd say it's definitely one of Williams' best games from back then, if not their absolute best. Because um, I never, hot take, I never really was a big fan of Defender, but this one I could see why it gets all its accolades. I was going to say in between Tapper and Zookeeper, because I like Tapper better, but I think it's a great game. I put it below Earthbound. Wow. I yeah, think it's I, better I saw, than okay, Bionic Commando? You yes, I love more than higher than Bionic Commando because how many games do you see these days that have like that sort of wire arm mechanic, like pretty much just Bionic Commando rearmed? Whereas something like Robotron is still being, you know, it's basically being remade to the end of time today, and it, there's still which, games that are still using that control scheme. I mean, modern FPS games could even be said to owe a lot to Robotron, uh, specifically yeah, but- because of the twin sticks. I want, uh, I want I it's better than Galaga, spot. even though like Galaga is 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 phenomenal. Like uh, Robotron's mm. great, but uh, like Galaga, come on. Mm. Uh, I would. I yeah. That's I would probably rate it better right than there. Galaga, I mean, and I really like as Galaga. As an adrenaline junkie, yeah. I much prefer Robotron. Robotron I, is definitely it's faster than Galaga. I candy. Sure. Yeah, but Galaga has the whole risk reward system of like getting your ship captured and all that. Yeah, uh, but then Robotron has all the civilians running around. I'm not. I know you argued against me, Risk World, but there's still a really major mechanic that is not mm-hmm. present in a lot of other games. Look, I I just really love Robotron. Um, if you guys want to try and negotiate it lower, you can. I I, I love it too. That's, That's the thing. Uh, but like all of these games uh, up up in the top twenty five, yeah. top thirty are really good. R- ranking the good ones versus the good ones is it's going always to be really the hottest because. Whenever you rank a good game, you got to push good games lower, which is that's that's tough, you know. And and, and you are ranking it above Blue Stinger, I might add. I, I was going to say <laughs> be, because Xerxes the isn't here, Stinger. we don't we have to. Quit. I mean, this game lacks Dogs Bower, but I'd say Hot Take it's better than Blue Stinger. <laughs> hey, we don't. Hey, Dogs Bower could be in the game. He could be one of the unnamed civilians. We just don't know. <laughs> I don't think it's better than Galaga. I, I, I mean, I, I love it. I think it's great, but I would rather play Galaga if I was going to do a high score tournament or something like that. I, I, I would probably play a Robotron before I play Kicks if I, if I was going to say it. Um, so you're um, thinking in the uh, between Galaga and Drill Dozer tier, essentially here. Uh, we're looking. I, at. I think Drill Dozer is a great game. I'm, I'm not even going to uh, compare it to that. But uh, if if you're going to ask me whether I would rather play Galaga or or Robotron, I'd rather play Galaga. I think Ga- Galaga is just I don't know. It's you can't beat that type of shooter for Galaga, and Kix is is a great ele- uh, you know primal arcade game, uh, just as Robotron is. But I, I think that Robotron is is very influential, much more so than Kix ever was. Well, I mean, I don't know how many people could, you know, you know, you play Robotron, and I think most people would at least get it. Like, yeah, this is great. Like, I can see why this is great. I can see why people like this. You know, it's like it is like it is a primal arcade game. We were talking about when we've talked about Tapper and how it does like one thing and it does one thing well, and it's like that's its that's its experience. It. Okay. But to me, um, Robotron is the the distilled pure essence of a twin stick shooter. There's nothing superfluous in Robotron. Absolutely nothing. You can't really a, go simpler than it either. That's the thing. It's the foundation. It's the root of the tree, pretty like, much. Like you can go simpler and make it worse. You can't go simpler and make it better. It is as simple as it absolutely can be. I wouldn't mind putting it somewhere in the the Gallagher range. You know, I'm not. I'm not I, sold at. Point a billion, I was but... going to suggest between Galaga and Drill Dozer at this point. If you guys, I agree uh, with that. Would be... Right? Yeah. Looking at <laughs> this, compromise? looking at it, yeah. It's okay. it's one of those things that's hard to rank because uh, Galaga was that. That's another influential sort of game. Um, Drill Dozer, I meant. A lot that, of influential. Just, so the thing is, Galaga never really had anything that innovated enough to stick in people's mind i mean there's galaga 88 which is a great game right and Mm -hmm. and but like in terms of that shooting gallery space invader style game of galaxian and galaga galaga is the one that stuck you have the risk reward which uh, galaxian didn't have and it's faster and you have the bonus stages which are a lot a lot of fun and you can last a while on that game, even on one quarter, and, and new people can get into it, and new new gamers can always play it. But uh, I, I don't think any... It, it's really been improved upon. Almost anybody will either play Miss Pac-Man or Galaga. Um, yeah. That's, that's just my thought. 
Yeah, Robotron, you're probably not going to find as much, so I'd say, if not just for, like, being a little less ubiquitous, that's why I'd rank it just beneath Galaga, but, I don't know, it's kind of like comparing apples to oranges, they're both really very is. influential and fantastic games that I think are still fun to play today. You know, looking at the arguments that have been put forth here, I could definitely see it being, eh, it's squished in between Galaga and Drill Dozer. You know, yeah. it would be nice that they could tie, you know, because they're both they're both interesting sort of games, and it's really hard to weigh one over the other, you know, when you I, get I down agree. to it. We're all winners but, here, but one has to lose. All right, let the record show that Robotron 2084 is our number, what is it, number s- seventh? It's our seventh game, I believe, now? Yeah, uh, I believe Galaga? it's our seventh. Um, no, no, it, yep. it doesn't push Galaga down. Galaga's seven, right? Oh, uh, no. So, no, uh, you're looking at the numbers wrong. It's, yeah, it's, the list it's, is kind of weird. Oh, it starts off at the two. first line is title. This is not going to make sense to anyone because I know no one looks at this document, even though we have made it available. No, it's an Excel you, document. You I get it. Refuse to look at it. Bit.ly slash forty seven. So technically, our number one game on this list is actually title. <laughs> followed by Super Mario Bros. Well, you can't have a game without a title, so... You well, know, it's, it's, it's title Genesis. on platform. It's one of my favorite uh, episode sponsor of title all time. or For our second game, we have The Uncanny X-Men, which was nominated for us by at Jacko underscore Moran and was published by LGN. So I think you're kind of uh, getting a feel here for what we're in for. But it was published on December 9th, 1989 for the NES. So I I, I have a major question for you. Has there ever been a group of canny X-Men? Uh, ask That's Chris. A good question. Ask Chris Claremont, I suppose. I think he was the one that specifically trademarked the word "uncanny" for his uh, for his works. But I that, no, no, uncanny was a. Uh was was the original title of the series uh oh, by okay. uh, by uh uh Jack Kirby and uh and Stan Lee there. Oh, my bad. Um Yeah, that was the original title. I meant they've been known that uh, for ages. I, yeah, it's just like the incredible Iron Man, uh the incredible Hulk. Well, I I don't know if we want to get to the blunt right here, but this It's uh it's prime LGN. It's a prime steaming yeah. pile of LGN. LGN we've got here. And the- Toy makers wait, wait, and... so Tenga, I have to give you credit. Uh, I believe you're, it didn't become the Uncanny X-Men until 1975. Oh, okay. So, uh, okay. so you are right. Uh, well, if we're going to talk about real comics, X-Men is not really the place to start, because I think that has <laughs> one of the most convoluted uh, canons of any comic book well, series. Well, when you have, like, 50 characters of note in it, it that... that... Well, they usually I think it's tr- hundreds at this point. I think you got a, at least a, maybe a hundred. Well, you could probably usually so any- like, oh yeah, I heard that. I've heard of that guy. Well, and um, it's kind of sad though because the X Men nowadays, because of a trade or not a trademark dispute, but sort of a licensing issue between Fox and Marvel Disney. slash Disney. Yeah, they're they're they've been slowly trying to kill them off and kind of, or at least uh, shove them off into a corner in the comics and instead introduce the Inhumans. Or you know whatever whatever it is. Uh, I think it's the yeah. humans. I th- Once I- Disney gets them back, they'll start they'll stop being lame they in the did. comics. Um, right. Uh, you guys want to I- talk about the game? The only thing that would have made this game worse is if it had been an Inhumans game, because then it wouldn't even have the license to back it up. Uh, well, anyway, I, I, I'll, I'll put the Kai Bosch in real comics talk here. And well, I, I think it's important we bring that up because this game is about as much of a mess as the whole licensing issues Ooh, and the nice. canon uh, surrounding this, is, this game. This is literally one, nice one of the worst NES games ever made. It, 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 really and that's is. no exaggeration. It's, it's awful. You have probably... I mean, I know the AVGN did a video about this, so uh, that's one point against it, that it is... a uh, well, I actually did so on several uh, X-Men games, but this one is just a s- black hole of quality. I only I'm not like- even sure the game was finished. Like, there's bits <sighs> and pieces in it that make it seem like it was, yeah, like, it's just like a test game or something. Or, you know, it, it, was, just- it was finished, but only in the absolute, like, it, you can complete it. Um, so explain well, to the listeners what kind of game this is. Like, explain you can what the action is like. 
Explain what the action is like here for the for the listener. Okay, so for those of you who haven't played the game or who haven't already cracked open a video to see what the game is, um, basically it's this sort of top-down shooter slash brawler sort of thing. Like, okay, so you get a team of six X-Men to choose from. You know, you've got half of them, you know, can have some sort of blast attack. So that would be Cyclops, Iceman, and um, Storm. And then the other half are all brawlers. They can they can only punch enemies, and that would consist of Wolverine, Colossus, and Nightcrawler. Um, I believe each of the characters has – some of them have unique abilities. Like there's a jump button, which I don't think that actually does anything unless your character has a special ability. In which case, um, I think Iceman can fly. Storm, I think, can also fly. And uh, Nightcrawler can fly through walls. Everybody else, I think, just jumps. Wait, they actually so- – they actually have a Nightcrawler's Bamf in here. I, I couldn't even figure that out. So so I, I have to say that this is um, the only way I can explain this game is if anybody's looked into Square's early games, it's kind of like King's Knight, but worse somehow. And King's King, Knight King, isn't exactly a prize pig either. King, so. King's Knight is a piece of garbage, but uh, it, it's it, it's at least functional. <laughs> yeah, this I would. This is barely on the cusp of being a functional game. I mean, there's. I don't know what the goal even is in the game because okay, so for some reason this game has mandatory co-op. If you're playing single player, you have to pick at least two X Men, and odds are good if you're playing by yourself or even if you're playing with another human being, one of the X Men is going to die even if you somehow manage to beat a stage. So it's like you're going to be down one guy at that point. It's like Frodo Daikatana, um, as uh, except the AI is even that. dumber, like. That's a feat. Oh, my God. Like, it John Romero will give you credit with the words, too. Like, all, they also, okay, all the X-Men in the game also... And make you a bitch. Yeah. God damn it. <laughs> you, you can, all of the X-Men in the game, though, they have a stat, and one of the stats is willpower, and I assume that's supposed to be how smart the AI is, but they all behave exactly the same. They just will run into a pit and die, or a laser beam, or a crushing door, and die instantly. I know. Um, so, when, when you say that the AI, you know, die, and then they, they leave... Um, between stages, do you just you essentially just lose an X Men, and you then you have a certain set list? You lose an X Men, I believe, unless you go to the training stage again. Um, there is a training stage, and in order to exit it, I actually had to look this one up um, because there's no obvious exit. It's just this small little arena where you can just shoot enemies and stuff and walk around. You have to hold A, B, and start, and apparently that will replenish your team. So I, I guess you, go, I guess you take them to the. Um, the danger room, whatever you want, the, whatever you call it. They couldn't even get the names of the various X Men things right, or even I mean, had it, any it, sort of. It's called the time chamber, or whatever from Dragon Ball Z, right? <laughs> what? Yeah, the no, metabolic geez. time chamber. There we so, go. Um, one, one thing I have to bring up as well is that LJN was just a publisher of titles, and it was like a sister uh, publisher to Acclaim. So, like, they didn't make this. Um, it was made by a company called Pixel. Did anybody do any research on Pixel? Uh, is, isn't I it couldn't... allegedly made by Pixel? I believe that they never actually. Uh, it was probably put, farmed they out. They never, to they a never put their like hand Pixel. up and said. Maybe, maybe we Pixel did this. is like an Alan Smithy title. For all we know, this was something made by. Uh, I don't know Atlas. Like I know well, that this game doesn't have credits days. or anything. Like no one will tell you who made this game. They were so proud of this game, they don't <laughs> tell you who made it. Uh, uh, There's a further question: Was this made by a Japanese or an American company? It was made by a, a, a Japanese company. Pixels, a, a Japanese company, and I'll, I'll tell you a couple other notable titles that they made. Um, they they programmed uh, Baseball Stars Two uh, for the NES. Huh. Uh, which is is a is a decent game. It's not as good as the original on NES uh, or the any of the arcade games, but it's a good game. It's not it's not terrible. And um, they actually helped program Over Horizon, which is one of our favorites, actually. Um, Over Horizon is hot B. So you have a, a semi uh, that has you have a, a a company that has some pedigree. I, I know some LJ game LJN games were actually made by Atlas and uh, Rare. Uh, of all companies, and and a lot of them turned out terrible. There, there's there's some real crap uh, here in LJN, but they were all made by different companies. Is is my point? Um, they they were probably just in development for a few weeks, just made to sell the the license. This is an absolute crap game, and nobody should play it unless they want to. It's not even good bad. Like it's just yeah, like, well, okay. Here's a good indication of quality. So. In order to beat the game, you first have to beat the uh, previous. You have to beat 
four of the main stages. There's a training stage and then four main stages. Then you have to use a code to access the final stage. And in order to do that, or yeah, in order to do that, you have to hold a certain you have to hold a certain key combination at the title screen, I believe, or at the level select screen. Now they actually published the um, they actually put the code on the cartridge itself, but they printed it wrong. It's actually missing one of the buttons you need to press to be able to reach the final stage. So you can't even technically beat the game. And Friday Allegedly, the, they Friday were the supposed 13th. to put it in the game, and then they didn't. Friday the 13th, That's... by the way, was made by Atlas, just so you know. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, that... Hmm. Yeah. So, uh, I, I, it was a long road to Shin Megami Tensei for them. <laughs> I mean, you, you guys, uh, you know, you definitely... Uh, I don't know if really you're sticking it to this game, you're refusing to talk about this game, and I can't imagine why, but uh, this game's... It is bad, uh, but it is at least... Uh, it has like at least this sort of fun Japanese NES license title surrealism to it, which I, I think at least elevates it slightly. Right, the visuals um, are kind of interesting. Um, some of the enemy types are amusing, if not and threatening. And have like, nothing to do with the X Men, by the way. Just like hi right. kids, teenage... I'm Eyeball Spring. <laughs> which, which, <laughs> it, 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 I liken it to Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. You know, the first one. It has like the enemies yeah, have like, absolutely nothing to do with guys anything. made of fire and chainsaw murderers and all that. Like, well, this game is just like cubes or something. Like, they're not actual things; they're just shapes. It's well, weird. you get to fight skeletons in like uh, Geiger esque, like Lo- chomping teeth. Logan like, and the Argonauts. Yeah, that's. It's, I think that's stage four, which it's interesting. Some of the stages actually do mirror things that exist in the X-Men comics. Like there's one stage that says destroy the robot factory. And you're like, oh, it's the Sentinel factory. And it's just a generic, you know, it's just a generic gray tile set with some vaguely robotic looking enemies. And then there's attack the bio ship. And it's like, oh, is that the uh, is that the brood? Which I don't know if they existed at that point. I think they did. Right, and there's another stage that references, I think, that's like, oh, that could have been the Phalanx, but again, it's not. And same thing with the Bioship. It's just like, it's basically um, Salamander from a top-down view, you know, and you can walk around in these sort of weird gut, you know, I mean, they that's look pretty like guts cool. and stuff. And yeah, that's it nice. It is, but it's like, with a little bit of a tweak, it could have been related to the X-Men. That's the fascinating thing about this game, is there actually are elements that are mirrored in the comics, but they didn't even bother to do that. They just threw in eyeball springs and weird centipede yeah. monsters. And... and this game, this game really like broke my heart as a kid because I, I was a huge comic book fan. And I was also a big fan of, uh, uh, Batman and, uh, the animated series and X-Men, the animated series. I just love stuff like that. And, uh, like this was before, before X-Men in the animated series. But like when I was growing up, I had an NES. So, and I was watching it. So like I would go out and run it. Right. So, it, you know, you go and you play something like this and there's no good representation of the X-Men. Like, like there's nothing good until, uh, Konami's Konami's arcade title. Uh, there, there's really nothing good X-Men related. For a long I mean, time. it certainly it definitely feels like a very curious generic game, which definitely just has like the X Men kind of smudged on top hastily. And, like this... and then, then they made other games like uh, other X Men games, like uh, Spider Man and the X Men in Arcade's Revenge, which is also garbage. Like it's just it's slightly more playable. You can at least beat the first stage, which is actually kind of a it's actually a fun little stage, and then the rest are like. We're gonna drop you into a bottomless pit full of spikes and crushers and stuff. Um, but and yeah, we our our focus does kind of keep drifting away from the NES game. Well, it's it's because... hard to talk about this game because it, it, outside it, of the it's... disappointment, outside of the terrible graphics and you know the dubious mechanics and the fact that the game's not even beatable unless you go online nowadays to look up the code. Uh, it's select being an. an up and start, I believe, is the actual code, but they cut off the part that says select. So yeah, like there isn't too okay. Much, it's, it's... Well, you know, if you know, with that like sort of summary of the experience, let let's just rein this one in. I think let's put it somewhere. Right. You know where I it's think going, it's the but worst let's put game. it somewhere. I think it's the worst game. Uh, I I like I, I refuse have... to dethrone Eek the Cat over this. Yeah, but Eek um, the Cat oh is functional. Fuck, goddamn it, Kel. Eek, Eek the Cat is at least <laughs> functional. Like it, 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 you I may... think this game is functional. I don't you think can, so. It's functional in the sense that you can play it. You can put it in your NES. Hits the start button. It's, you know, maybe pick two X Men and die. It's but... as quote unquote functional as a fucking Tennessee Williams play. I do not. 
No, no, that's an esoteric reference. I just can <laughs> do not know what the hell I am doing with this. Maybe, maybe it's my fault I can't understand this game, but I'm getting the impression that I'm not the only one who's lost on it. The rules are not clear. The hit detection is non-existent. The it's it's a buggy mess. You can't even beat it unless you cheat. Uh, like it, it it's it's a complete piece of garbage. Like and, it, it, and there's think, no good reason to play. But it. are you saying you'd rather play Eek the Cat? Yes. Because that's 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 what I want to make sure. I want to hear this. Like Eek I want to say, I would rather I would play rather a play Eek platformer Eek that is an escort quest for the entire game than play this. Look, I, I would rather play that and Krusty's Funhouse at the same time. With the <laughs> You're insane. You're crazy, man. That's, uh, I, uh, that's okay, too here's much. The thing, Cal, here's the thing, Cal. This game also has an escort mission. You always have to pick two players and one player. Yeah, but that guy dies straight away. It's will. fine. You could switch between them at will, but one of them's always going to die. It's an escort mission you can't even win. Yes, but it doesn't punish you much. You know, like, As you said, you can somehow revive That's your character. That's assuming you could like, need a stage, though. Like, every time you die, you lose an X-Men, so you'll probably end up with Nightcrawler by the end of it, who can't... He, like, dies in a single hit to anything. He can't well, do just, a damn yeah, I, Just play as Iceman, and you'll be fine. Okay? Look, just, just... look, the only NES game that I can even pick out to be worse than this game is Dragon's Lair. Okay, well, uh, look, Dragon's Lair isn't even... Like, it goes in Crazy Bus Town. It's not even a game. <laughs> Yeah, it got published and it got the Nintendo seal of quality, sir. <laughs> well, I believe that Nintendo are very frivolous with their alleged seal of quality. <laughs> You're probably right. Well, um, hmm. look, if you guys if you guys want to dethrone Eek, I'm not going to stop you. I'm just gonna, as long as we're, you know, as long as you're all aware what you're doing here. You're, look, look, we're, pick, we're, we're picking between piles of crap right here. I know, I know, and you gotta pick one to eat, and here, you have to decide. I, I, I'm gonna see if I can uh, <laughs> well, actually good. try and justify this. I think that, like, the ultimate insult about the X-Men game is that absolutely nothing in it has to do with the X-Men. You know, except for your character portraits. That's the only thing. If you took those and out... And the in-game sprites, I mean, they all use the same body, but they at least have heads that look vaguely like the X-Men. Kind of say, say what you want about Silver Surfer. At least it had something to do with Silver Surfer comics. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, like, that's a bad game, too, but at least it has uh, some I don't know whether it, in it. Um, it, it's, it's a bad game, but it's Fun. It tries in, in, to be a game, not like this. It, it's addictive. Rush out the it's door. at least addictive. Yeah, like, you try to beat that game. You, there's a challenge to trying to beat that game, right? You could you could play that with your friends and have a good time. Yeah, I mean, I it, could never have a good time with Uncanny X. Yeah, I mean, Silver Surfer is way too hard for. Did its anyone own good play Uncanny like X Men uh, with a second person? Because you you are saying it is kind of co-op and i assume no one actually I, I think, i'm pretty yeah. sure it would be just as bad because there are a lot of things on the board that'll instantly kill you if you just stand on them for two seconds enemies can spawn on top of you and kill you instantly um there are crushers and laser beams that you have to you have to wait for enemies to drop a specific power up so you can walk through them without dying and in single player what happens is the the ai will always hit one of those and die you're pretty much giving somebody up to this you know to this you know no, what i mean like is, you know, a lamp to the slaughter and okay, here's the other thing. It has that kind of scrolling where the screen only scrolls if both players are in the right spot. So you're probably going to spend a lot of the game trapped, and the other, you know, the players are going to get like smooshed between things and die. It's probably not going to be any better with the second person. I'm also going to go out on the limb and say that this is probably the worst game that LJN ever published. It's and that's saying there, a lot. Yeah. I think you know, maybe I can't only think of anything that's worse. M- maybe Back to the Future, but and, and oh back yeah, to the Back to the Future two and three. Is, two and three. Th- those ones yeah. are really horrendous, but this one back really. Back to the Future two and three is really bad. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. I, I actually rented that one. I have bad memories. This one I haven't played until recently, but if I had played it back then, I think I would have been as uh, crushed as you were, and uh, uh, like. Like uh, that, I would have feel totally suckered. Like this is the shit that LJN kept pulling. Like they they just try to sell things on name recognition alone without giving a crap about the quality. And, uh, and that, the should, that should be criminal, pretty, I think. And the cover's pretty neat. It looks exactly like the front of a comic book. It, that's, it, that's, it has. That's the most X Men that this game has to do with it. The freaking cover. None of that's in the game. It's just it, it's a total lie. Fakers, cheaters, bastards. <laughs> They okay, only released right. this yeah. in the U.S. They didn't release this to the rest of the world, so that's something. 
Yeah, I'm not in the U.S., so I have no ill memories of this game. <laughs> well, I'm gonna. I'll say this about the Uncanny Axeman versus Eek the Cat. With Eek the Cat, you kind of you're not expecting really a good game. I mean, you can. I mean, I love the show. I love it. I'm um, I'm surprised because you love you, you like the Eek the Cat. And this is- yeah, I love Eek the Cat, but I, you don't really expect a game like, or a show like that to have a really good game associated with with it. Whereas with X Men, it's like that's almost pure action. Like you can you could think of so many good games you could make out of that. And Konami did. Konami did. Um, Sega did. Um, I think Raven Software made a really good Wolverine game. Like there's like th- th- there is the potential there, but this game, it's. It doesn't even have like not even the license saves it, you know. Yeah, not even it's the definitely license. the worst X Men game as well. There's right. nothing that even comes close to it. It, it is a well, game. You know, I don't. I don't need to defend this game from being bad. You know, I know it's bad. I, right. I understand. I understand the arguments you're making here because Eek is pretty bad too. But Eek is uh, the game itself is at least. I mean, it's based off the pilot episode, um, I believe, uh, where he has to well, well, basically has to escort somebody, but he, you know, he dies in the in process. A, in the sense that it's a just a, it's a literally a different game that has had Eek the Cat added into it. Like right, that's, that's the experience. Right. And but the original game itself was probably functional. I meant it didn't have the license associated with it, but it was playable. I'm willing to let it go below Eek the Cat, and the main reason, which no one has mentioned, and I was hoping someone would, but Eek the Cat has a decent soundtrack that you can actually listen to outside of the game. You can download I, I the soundtrack and listen to it and enjoy I don't know, did you mention it this uh, time? I, I, I might have just briefly said so. Well, I did want to say, though, that, yeah, well, what's the soundtrack with the with X-Men? It's it's nothing. It's generic. Dip, dip, it's, loop, that, exactly. It's Lisa and Bloops. It's the stereotype that you get of that. It's it's really bad, yeah. So I, for, I forget um, who post Reek the Cat, but credit for him for not making it an absolute abomination. I'm happy to declare the Uncanny X-Men to literally be the worst game of all time to date. Um, and I don't <laughs> no, think of all any time. So far, it's of until all time. Until we get so. to, to Dragon's Lair NES. Uh, Do not so. submit Dragon's Lair NES to us. God damn it. A uh, 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 abort. Like, we're we're, we're going to attract reverse okay, psychology. Okay, okay, flies. okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drop the gavel here. I'm going to say, let the record show. Uncanny X-Men for the NES is the absolute worst game ever released. Worse than Eek the Cat, worse than Caverns of Kafka, even worse than Amagon. And that's scientific. Right along from that flaming LGN train wreck, we're um, straight to our third game, Sin and Punishment, which was nominated by at Gord Captain and at Solaceris. Sin and Punishment was developed by Treasure, and it was published pretty late in um, the N64's lifespan um, on November 21st, 2000. I'd like to say... Exclusively in Japan. Yes, yeah, that's right. Exclusively, exclusively in Japan. In J- in Japan until it was released on the Wii Virtual Console in uh, North America and Europe. Uh, and it was uh, didn't really need to be localized because it was already in English, I might add. But yeah, that's, a, that's always a strange decision. I, I always wonder why Japanese games do that sometimes. It, it's because Treasure is very much a fan of old arcade games, and arcade games are traditionally in English, even if they're Japanese only. Um, and that, that's just that the style of, of localization, things. too. Um, yeah, that's you know, just the style. It's just you, the you don't want to have to redo an entire translation of an arcade game just because you got like six lines of dialogue and they're all in Japanese. So it makes yeah. sense when 
most of them will speak enough English to sort of pick up what the characters are saying. Yeah, um, uh, I, I might add it has one of the most incomprehensible <laughs> stories of any game ever made. You are not kidding. More incomprehensible than it, Alien Soldier? That's a it, tall it, order. It's, way, it, it's even more incomprehensible than that. It's like a, it's a, like a funhouse mirror version of Evangelion that makes even less I sense. was going to say, this is going to give frickin' End of Evangelion a run for uh, Hideaki Anno's money. I could... Uh, okay, basically, I, I think, think... it is a parody of Evangelion. Yes. I, I honestly huh. do think that. That's a good point. It could... Um, it, uh, is it I, definitely... I, I, I mean, hmm. a lot of Treasure's games are kind of plot-wank. Um, that's that's the only way to describe it, really. Is like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So many no, of the games are just garbage. Yeah, the plot plots. is cruft in every single treasure game. Um, I think no, maybe treasure. Hmm. Treasure games are pretty much just conceived as um, as mechanics first. I, I will outright say that they they come up with the mechanics way ahead of anything else, any concepts, and then they kind of form everything around it. Their music is great, but their stories are never good, and I'm a huge Trevor <laughs> fan. Uh, well, the only the only one that makes any sense is is Gunstar Heroes, and even that's disjointed. Yeah, and um, even it ends on a cliffhanger. All things considered, I, to anybody who is, who's ever played Star Fox or Star Fox 64, it's very close to Star Fox 64 or um, Panzer Dragoon, uh, like the action Panzer Dragoon games. It's a an on rails 3D. Pol- polygonal game that involves shooting things in front of you. Basically a descendant of games like, uh, you know, Operation Wolf and things like that, but you can actually move I your character. I believe Wikipedia addresses them as Cabal-likes or Cabal clones. It's similar to Cabal, Cabal. Or, or 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 NAM uh, 78 or, or, or Wild, Wild Guns or a whole yeah. bunch of uh, fun little games that are like that. Sim- this game does a little bit different, I think, um, in that it kind of, I think it's, maybe it's Panzer Dragoon or whatever that it kind of mirrors in that uh, you don't always see, unlike Star Fox, sometimes the camera moves around and sort of aims you in different directions rather than strictly being behind you the whole time, which is, it ends a nice cinematic touch to the game. It's definitely one of the more visually interesting cinematic experiences i would i would put it alongside if you want to compare it to a playstation game uh, omega boost like they have a sort of you know yeah. they, they have like a big uh, focus on sort of an arcade cinematic experience uh, rather than just being a pure action game that you are in control of you, you kind of just play the game in order to keep the game rolling you just got to keep shooting enemies and uh, hitting them with your sword um this and- game does make you dodge uh some of those games don't let you dodge this game does yeah this game is actually very much into its mechanics like most other great treasure games it it fits right in there and i might add that it's one of the very few uh 3d treasure games that's actually any good well you didn't like stretch panic <laughs> no <laughs> no one did i'm just being a dingus uh, i mean i own it and i i mean i'll play it because i'm a huge treasure nerd but it none of their 3d games really live up to much and oh, right. these two uh, this and its sequel are great games it's very much a, a, a an engine set piece game let's just put it that way but anyway um sin and punishment uh, it's it. First of all, I want to say it's a very, very much a crime that this game was not released in the U.S. officially on its original hardware. Um, the game really does use the N64's controller to to its fullest. Um, playing it on anything else is a little difficult, but it can be managed um, actually with the virtual console settings. I, I I might add that if you change the settings to Type. Three or Type C, I forget which which one it is, but it works really well with the classic controller, and it, it plays mu- very much like a modern game. But what's cool about it is that you have melee attacks, very similar to um, like Wild Guns or something like that, where you can bounce back attacks and also attack enemies with your like saber. It's it's a very good game. It's a lot of fun to uh, get combos on, try to get. Uh, better scores with it. It's very much a descendant of arcade games and it's a lot of fun. I really like it a lot, but it is an, a hardcore fans kind of game. Again, uh, treasure games always are kind of like that, but it, 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 it it's a, it's a great game that is of that ilk. Yeah. Uh, it, I, it definitely has its own style to it. I mean, you can probably tell that 
It is a treasure game if you're familiar with the other works. Guns Are Heroes, Dine My Heady, Alien Soldier, Mischief Makers, um, all of which are <laughs> big favorites of mine. And um, But it... Like like you said, I cannot wrap my skull about what this game's supposed to be. All I can say is that it starts off with two Resistance fighters, Saki and Iron, uh, guarding some magical girl, a- Achi, for some reason. And then it ends with you fighting an evil duplicate of the planet Earth. What the yes. fuck? <laughs> uh, and I, I might add that this is the very f- first game that I know of that was kind of like kind of had like a family guy like revival you know how like uh adult swim because of reruns brought back several shows including adult uh family guy and uh Mm -hmm. futurama well this is kind of had a similar thing the uh, original sin and punishment went to the virtual console and was in uh, hugely popular in 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 the when the week uh released it in in north america uh, it sold a lot of uh, digital copies, so uh, because of that, the sequel was made, and the sequel's even better, if you ask me. I'm going to actually agree with you. Just a little quick sidebar. I think the controls are more on point. It's a longer and meatier game with even more impressive set pieces and bosses. Um, and yeah, I'll agree. It's probably the only treasure sequel uh, that's actually worth a damn. Um, well, but I know Missile Fury is really good. Uh, the 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 sec the sec hmm. uh, the third Bangayo game for uh, 360 is actually a great game. Can't remember I, if I've I, ever I really played that. that. Hmm. Uh, it, it, it's really good, but that okay. it, it, that was pretty much the last game they released in the U.S. Um, That's fair. But, uh, uh, in, in, if you don't count re-releases of Ikaruga and uh, Guardian Heroes, but this game, first of all, it was a shame that it was never released on on Western shores. But it, yeah. it's also one of the very few games worth importing. But Bear Cart will cost you around thirty bucks, which isn't bad at all. Wow. That's not that's not bad. That, yeah. That's um, I, I didn't think I didn't think it was bad. It was bad. Um, uh, I didn't think it was super expensive. It's not one of the super expensive collectible games for the system. Even even a full box copy. Copy will only net you fifty five bucks uh, uh, for a buy. I'm going to assume that this game is actually not that popular in Japan, then, because yeah, well, Treasure seems to have more fans in the U.S. Believe it or not, which makes the fact that they didn't huh, manage to get this one out in the U.S. It is definitely a surprise. This game definitely would have appealed more to the U.S. Yeah, um, I, I... so the fact that they kind of dropped the ball on that one. I want to uh, say tri- that we just didn't get it because uh, it is like l- twi- Twilight System Death Slot, basically. Uh, un- unless it was like a game that Nintendo made themselves, anything that's released uh, at the end of a console's lifespan is definitely not going to be seen. They were already pushing for the GameCube around this time. Uh, oh, I definitely remember that. I I was uh, picking um, Conker's Bad Fur Day off discount shelves for twenty bucks a pop. So. Um, yeah, I go think... for ridiculous money now too. Yeah, go have a look at how much a copy of Conker's Bad Fur Day costs, and then it's like a hundred bucks. Know, yeah, I think the furious. Xbox version being absolutely terrible definitely helped in that respect. Uh, I don't think the it's shocking, Xbox version really is actually ter- uh, the Xbox version's not actually not that terrible, if you ask me. I think that it looks beautiful. First oh, of all, oh, in terms of Conker's Bad Fur Day, I would definitely go with the Xbox version if I had to um had to pick one. Um, it's cheaper. Uh, to begin right. with, yeah, and, so there's uh, that, and you it, can get it on Rare Replay. Uh, the original it also version on Rare Replay runs a lot better. Um, the N64 version really pushes the N64 too hard. Um, which I don't know if Sin and Punishment does that. I think it runs pretty smooth in general. It's quite no, a, it's smooth. It's smooth. Which is which is good because it looks good too. Um, they definitely really focused on keeping like the poly count and everything nice and nice and even so that the game runs. Uh, quite well, which is a little surprising since a lot of late-release N64 games chugged the system. And you remember Perfect Dark Vista or Villa level? Boy, that was a lot of fun at one <laughs> frame per second. I love quite a few games for the N64, but I think it's uh, Vise's most hated system ever. I, I, I okay. forget exactly. So, uh, l- <laughs> let, me, let me explain that. Um, it's my hated, most hated piece of hardware, but I love a lot of the software on it. Like, some of my favorite games of all time are on that system. Uh, Ocarina of Time is undeniable. Uh, you know, I, I, I love Mischief Makers. I love Sin and Punishment. I, I love a lot of games for the system. In fact, my favorite Bomberman games are on the system. Oh, I, uh, I love the first Bomberman in 64 a lot. Um, yeah, uh, uh, F-Zero uh, is a fantastic mm-hmm. game on 
on on N64. Yeah, N64 has, has some great titles and and some really great output, but the hardware is complete garbage. I and, have to and, agree. And, I have to. It's so and much so, fun. So is the controller for that Oh, matter. Jesus Christ, you're not kidding. I wanted to say, uh, back to Sin Punishment, the controls are kind of tricky for a game like this. Um, at least I think so. It, uh... Like, I think you might have already said, but if you don't map it out exactly, you're going to be stumbling around, confusing the cursor with your movement. Um, yeah, and I, I might add I might add that um, this, like like a lot of other N64 games, is actually best uh, best played on, on, on this system just because of the way that the controller uh, works. Uh, but yeah. it, it is serviceable. It is actually really good with the classic controller. If you put it on, 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 on Type-C... Uh, controller mode and and this is also one of the few n64 games that's on the wii u uh virtual console by the way so yeah it makes definitely say if you are going to play it wii u version definitely yeah the wii the wii u version is cleaned up it has a smoother frame rate uh just like all n64 games it looks a lot better uh, through emulation that it does on the actual system. Um, and um, N- N- Nintendo's official emulators make it look really great. I recommend if you have to play any games that were re-released, uh, there's only a few at this point that have not been re-released that are still worth playing on the N64. Uh, Mischief Makers is the big one that hasn't shit, been shit. Ha- had a re-release in any any uh, respect. But um, like all the rare games have been released on um, Virtual Console or the Xbox One uh, at this point, but it's almost always better to uh, play them on those systems. It's just that this particular game, it, it, it very much uses the controller in a way um, that only the N64 makes sense with. I you feel can, the same is true of uh, Star Fox 64 feels a bit weird on anything except the N64 controller. That's another one of those games that kind of suits the controller. So, does anyone else have much to say about Sin and Punishment itself before we uh, try and put this somewhere? The game's got a lot of bosses in it. <laughs> yeah, and the bosses... It's a treasure game. Like any treasure game are great, they're a lot of fun, mm. and a lot of times they're even comedic. They're yeah. fun. It has a counter system, it has a lot of cool systems in it, it's a difficult game, but it's very rewarding. This is going to be near the top, but I'm. We have so many good top games here, and I'm. Yeah. I'm not. I don't know. In in terms of it, it's Treasure's best games, um, we already have two of Treasure's best games on here. We have Alien Soldier and Ikaruga, which are like the top of the heap. Uh, we don't have Gunstar Heroes in there, which would probably be even higher than both of those. But we don't have anything else by them yet. I don't you think have other it's games. Better. Yeah, I don't. I don't think it's better than Ikaruga, um, uh, even though I love it. But anybody else can weigh in on that. Well, my opinion of Sin and Punishment is that it has a mystique that I don't think is equaled by its quality. It's, it is a good game, but I I do wonder if you know you know it, it regularly gets nine out of tens and ten out of tens from uh, reviewers. And I do think at least part of that has been the fact that it was. Um, it was on a system that was not super well known for really solid action games. Um, of Which this is type, weird because the uh, oh that type. But I was going to say the N64 was pretty much an FPS powerhouse. Like that was the system yes. to own for that sort but, of yeah. shooty stuff. They're also not the same kind of FPS that you sort of right. get now. They're, they're not like that high octane sort of thing. They're very right. um, methodical games. But uh, you know, like it's it is a game that the N64 was kind of lacking, and it was also quite a strong game that was released out, not released outside of Japan. So I do feel like. This game has a lot going for it because of its circumstances, but the actual game itself is good, but it's not like the most transcendual game. Oh, I was going to say, if I compare it to something like uh, kind of close to similar time, probably a few years after, but you know, like something like Res has like a very impressive visual style to go along with its, um, uh, you know, sort of on rail shootery shootery. Um, and on the same time, like I think I would prefer Star Fox 64 over Sin and Punishment because I think. Star Fox 64 has a little bit more variety. Uh, it's a bit more friendly to the player, but still has some challenge in terms of expert mode. And uh, it also has kind of a story that doesn't break your brain. Uh, it's not like the most phenomenal story ever, but has coherent characters. Well, um, I, I, you bring up something interesting in, in, in that uh, as far as on-rail shooters go, 
my favorite of all time is Star Fox 64. I think it's great. I, I mm. absolutely love that game, and it's really hard to argue with that. I mean, you could you could say what you want about it, but it, it's a great, 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 great game. Uh, no, it's uh, totally uh, what fantastic. it does. I, I just uh, wish we had uh, Star Fox 2, though, also. But no, 64 is amazing. I, I have to say that a quick follow-up to that is um, Panzer Dragoon Orta and Panzer Dragoon mm. Vi. They're both all, uh, they're yeah. like Orta is is a, is a is a fantastic freaking game, and so is Res. Uh, Res is like a descendant of Panzer Dragoon. No so this game is right up there with all of them, but it's not as good as Star Fox. It, it, Star Fox is pretty much the the example you go to for this type of game. Just kind of like um, you know. If we if we had to talk about you know great uh, Gal- Galaga being a great like space invader style game, Galaga is it. This game is really really good, but uh, it, and it deserves a high ranking. But I'm not exactly sure where you guys want to put it. Mm. Well, yeah, when you do put its story elements aside, it is just a fantastic, really high octane experience of full of bosses, of full of tricks and twists. You never feel like you're doing the same thing for very long. It's for the most part, it is very varied. Uh, although one point I will dock uh, with is that the second last thing you have to do before fighting the giant Earth duplicate is that you have to go through this weird, very long, uh, compared to the rest of the game, kind of platforming segment, which I feel does not fit the rest of the game very well. I mean, the, I the, agree. Game, the game's perspective, for the most part, is, is like, uh, it's... It, it, I want to say that this qualifies as a Cabal-like, you know, that short uh, genre of games that was inspired by the game uh, Cabal, uh, its sequel, Blood Brothers, uh, Wild Guns, probably what everyone knows best, that type of game. Uh, behind Let's the back... Don't forget Pias. Pias, yeah, Pias. by the Spanish company, um, Nix, I think it was. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's a short-lived but very fun arcade genre of games. Uh, I want to almost call them... Uh, Behind the back, single screen shooter. Uh, single screen shooters. Although this game is a single screen, you keep running. Just call them cabal like. So, Come on, yeah. you all know that. I, I, I would say it. that this is the best cabal like. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's even the, better than Wild Guns, if it, you ask me. And Wild Guns is the top. Before definitely, that. except for it, except for its sequel, Star Successor. I do think that yes. Sin and Punishment is the ultimate, uh, the apotheosis of the genre. That you could not get better than it. And thus, except for its sequel, I can't remember any other game like it that was released afterward um but that's why that one segment uh yeah like if i do have to give it any minus points that long platformy segment near the end is kind of a pain in the ass to control and you don't really even fight any bosses throughout it It really feels detached from the rest of the game which it feels so unfitting to the point that i wonder if it was just kind of rushed that part like it's near the end and like you know, they already had a lot of things going for it, and then they just kind of fell apart near the end there. So I'm wondering if maybe the development might have been a little hurried. Uh, I, I don't know, because the rest it of the game is... be treasure being treasure. Treasure sometimes will do that with their final stages, and they're well, well, to, yeah. do weird stuff with it. Con- to be fair, they, they were obviously running out of time for this game, because they couldn't mm. delay it. This game had to come out when it came out. Yeah, because yeah, the N64 was, was dying. Support. Yeah, definitely. Treasure tends to do things at their own pace, because they usually have a low budget, and all of their projects tend to be pet projects so like Mm. they they take their time with them they usually have a publisher that might throw them a bone like usually sega or um nintendo yeah i think nintendo Uh, was actually fairly heavily involved in the development i I think they they published it if i if i'm not uh, mistaken let me double check that but i'm i'm relatively sure well the treasure is kind of interesting because they had or have a similar uh company structure to valve and that they just sort of have a just a pile of people who just kind of chip away at a project until it's done. I, but I they don't have any money. They don't have any money. They don't have the money. Uh, so whereas <laughs> Valve don't release anything because they just just keep spending money on dicking around. Yeah, uh, Nintendo Treasure, this. By Treasure way. have no money, so they're just constantly scraping things together to hopefully release a project so before they go bankrupt tre- again. Treasure needs to release their own uh, PC distribution game client um, in order to stay afloat at this rate. It wouldn't hurt if they re-released some of their games, especially some of their I weirder mean, they, ones like chest. Silhouette Mirage. Call it the Treasure Chest. Isn't that great? That's well, excellent. Yeah, they, it's perfect. Uh, that's actually what the uh, Gunstar Heroes... Um, 
uh, the Gunstar Heroes collection with uh, Alien Soldier and Dynamite oh, Teddy yeah, on it on box. PS2 That's was called was the called. Treasure Box. Yeah, <laughs> um, we need we need to throw Sin and Punishment somewhere in our list. Um, well, uh, it's going to be tricky. Let's look I mean, at it from the perspective of other treasure games, because if we look between Alien Soldier and Ikaruga, we have games that are similar to treasure games. We have Ranger X, Contra Hardcore. Yeah, um, I was just going to say, it's in that territory. It's pro- Space Harrier, that sort of thing. Those sort of games. I hope we get to place it above UN Squadron. Uh, now, I actually your think order? right between <laughs> Ikaruga... I think actually in between our Ikaruga and UN Squadron is where it should be. It's a great game. It's not better than Ikaruga, but it's right there. I, I, I just, uh, I don't, I don't think it's better than Ikaruga, but it's it's better than everything else below it. I, I, uh, I have a hard time arguing with that. To be I, honest, I do think it is hard to push it much lower because I do think um, once we get below that, it's you're starting to get to games that I don't think have the quality of polish and execution that this game has um so i i do genuinely think that was actually where i was thinking of putting it i just didn't want to straight up uh my 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 major issue with it is that ikaruga is a little low for my taste but i'm a huge treasure fan and a big shmup fan and ikaruga is a little low but Uh, the main reason ikaruga ended up so low i think is just shmups as a genre is so hard to uh to play i I, I think i think it mostly plays down there just due to the difficulty i mean maybe it's just us being scrubs but uh it's it can be a hard game um to for most people to touch uh, even though it's one of the more accessible modern shmups there is so it's kind of a weird i would say it's the best modern shmup uh it's I don't think anyone modern. would disagree with you. I yeah. don't think, and that's that's actually why it that's got kind of, of the highest rated shmups on there, yes. isn't it? Like, there's well, nothing higher than, than it. Galica, but I am going to higher than Galica. I am going to it's argue not. that Eschatos is better than Ikaruga, but that will be a discussion for another day. <laughs> and I would I would say that Eschatos is is the o- only other shooter that's in the same mm, yes. in the same breath uh, of Ikaruga in the last twenty years. Gotcha, um, Xerxes. I'm going to want you to lock down. Uh, our current uh, cinema. You mean uh, Snarboo? Uh, no, I mean Xerxes. <laughs> okay, well, if I have to be Xerxes, I'll put on the Xerxes pants. But uh, anyway, so <laughs> let the record show. Sin and Punishment is between Ikaruga and UN Squadron, placing it at what? Um, 21st 22. place? I think oh, it's 21st. Plus, yeah. So 20 it's plus. right above UN Squadron. So. Yep. <laughs> Let the record show. Forever hold your peace, etc., etc. We love good stuff. Good stuff. It's a great back. spot. It's a great spot for it. So now we move on to our last, but certainly not least, game, um, Doom, uh, the 1993 version of the game, not the recently released game of the same name. But, but I think we did want to talk about the new Doom, since, uh, the, the, the old Doom, since the new Doom's uh, received so much awesome press lately. And I think it would right. be good it, to look it, at its it, roots. It, it, it makes sense, yeah, it makes sense to go back and look at the series' roots. But uh, in any case, the game was nominated by At M. Fedorowski and was developed by id Software, published in 1993, and was released for PC-DOS and eventually almost every single system that can run any kind of code at all. It, it's, yeah, including, including, you know, it's been calculators, it's been, washing machines, it, it doesn't matter. It, it's actually been run on ATMs as of late and also oscilloscopes, uh, which wow. is like the where er, er video games have come from with Tennis for Two were run on oscilloscopes, not even televisions. So, I think I like, saw a oscilloscope version of Quake, which looked absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, um, that was yeah. wild looking. 
Very yeah. cool looking stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think someone got it to run on a toaster, or they figured out how to turn a toaster into a controller, and then naturally played Doom with the toaster. <laughs> yeah, and uh, like um, even Java phones had a version of Doom on them. You know, even even flip phones could even play like some version of Doom. I mean, you know, people have backported it to like a ZX Spectrum because why not? You know, just <laughs> Doom. Yeah. So Doom. Uh, it, it's let's like let's start with is season. there a is there yeah is there a more ubiquitous game than Doom other than because I don't even think Mario counts because Mario is a character with a bunch of games okay Doom uh, uh, is Doom like well, it is well, wait that that that's part of our are going to be our argument here um, because like if you don't know what Doom is what uh, and you're listening to this podcast so you know who who the hell are you but like um it. It's the spiritual successor to Wolfenstein 3D, which is basically the first first first-person shooter. If we have to pick one, we're going to call it that. Even though it's not the first first first-person game, it's not the first game that has shooting and first person. (laughs) Yeah, it's not like in all technical ways, it's not the first first first-person shooter. But it is, yeah, yeah, it is the first game that is part of the genre of first. It's very, yeah, Um, yes. So Doom is, is very much kind of like Super Mario Brothers, the original kind of like it, it defines a genre that had lo- ill-fitting definitions and not a very good game to represent it. Like it, maybe the only other thing you could pick with Mario it before it is Pitfall, Super Mario Brothers. You, you could pick Pitfall as as uh, as a platform and maybe Donkey Kong, you know, those 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 games. But what what Super Mario Brothers is, it was the first of its game that it type to have scrolling and play the way it is and have mechanics based uh, that define an entire type of game. Right. So Doom is very much like that in that Wolfenstein definitely precedes it, but it it is much simpler in a lot of ways. Uh, its design is much more complicated in terms of visuals, in terms of theme, in terms of having music, in terms of uh, level design, in terms of how things are laid out in the level. Uh, Sound, like, lighting, just about every single feature you can think of has been expanded upon and then some. With so um, in layout is um, – um, uh, loadout is, is basically what defined first-person shooters here on out. Uh, having a shotgun is essential in a first-person shooter. You're not going to have any uh, a game that doesn't have a shotgun-like device. It, uh, it, it shotgun is is basically invented by by in video games is invented by Doom. Doom is uh, and Wolfenstein are kind of like an evolution of Berserk and Robotron, in that they're all about killing enemies within an arena and eliminating enemies within an arena. However, it is done in a in a 3D like space. I might add that it is not technically 3D. It's made to look like it's 3D. Um, and you perceive it as 3D, but it's actually a 2D space. Um, you can- well, I mean, yeah, it's a 2D space, but it's not, uh, you know, in terms of to the end player, it doesn't make a huge difference. They do a good job of dressing it up so that you feel like you're in a real space, which I think is uh, what I want to say is Doom as a game takes place in a sort of almost real space, which makes a huge difference over something like Robotron, like Berserk, which don't feel like real spaces. I mean, they put walls and stuff in them, but they never felt like they were like a location. They just kind of like avoid that you run around in. Uh, hey, I, Doom and Wolfenstein before it did it as well, but Doom definitely feels like an actual location. We haven't technically said what Doom is as a game, um, and we should at least say, you know, like what it is. Like you run around, you shoot things. Right. What it's is... it's what's known nowadays as a first-person shooter. You have the camera set inside of the players, the player character's eyes. You see your gun out in front of you, and you shoot enemies with it. You engage them by shooting them. And in in both Doom and Wolfenstein's case, you find an uh, an ever-improving arsenal of new weapons. Um, In Doom, you start off with just your bare fist and your pistol, and eventually you work work up to a weapon known as the BFG-9000, which basically disintegrates pretty much every single low-level enemy in the game. I think only bosses can stand up to it. (laughs) Big effing gun. Outside of that, it's hard to summarize what Doom is. I can say this. Doom was such a phenomenon that it actually defined the genre name for the longest time. Well, for a while, um, FPS games were known as Doom clones. If you were Mm. making an FPS game and publishing it to the market, you were competing against Doom. 
Um, there's very few genres that are like that. Roguelikes come to mind, and eventually there was another term used for, um, you know, Doom clones. It became FPS, I believe, after Quake. I think they had Quake clones for a teeny while, and then it's like, you know, we need a better term. Than um, that. Demon Souls and Dark Souls is like that as well. Um, they, they pretty much invent a new genre. The, yeah, that that's the closest new example uh, that I can think of. It, it is a game that defined. A, a and solidified a genre um and people don't call them wolfenstein like uh 3d likes you know they're they they just don't and there's a good reason for that um right. it's doom's pacing um is so much quicker and it's also in a much more realistic type of space wolfenstein 3d is very much kind of grid based everything is um in squares uh, whereas Doom is much more uh, analog, if I have to, if I have uh, to I say something. The term that's been that was thrown around, I believe, by John Carmack was non-orthogonal. That means the walls can be at any angle. In Wolfenstein, it's a grid. You know, you get blocks. But in Doom, you can, if you can draw, you can make a level in that game. And that's how a lot of the early levels were. People would draw shapes, and then they would connect the shapes together and create these spaces. And that's what defines Doom is sort of rooms. You know. The contrast between them, light and dark, um, tall, short, you know, that sort of thing. And what goes on in those spaces. And that's what gives it this sort of realistic feel. And that's n- that's not the only thing, too. Um, the game has sort of a light physics system to it. Yes. Um, there's some serious exploits with it because of how it was programmed. It was programmed to be very, very fast. Yes, you have okay. momentum in the game. And you even sort of have, I wouldn't call it jumping, maybe Zelda-style jumping. There are cases where you have to run off a ledge and quickly, you know... You know, hit a, the next one right below in order to progress. Like there's a there's actually some jumping puzzles in the game, which is very. I think this is the very first first person shooter to do that, unless you want to count Ultima Underworld. But I don't know if that had jumping in it. In any case, it's it's a 3D space, and it was a 3D space before that was very common in games. Keep in mind, Doom came out in '93. This was before, you know, the PlayStation, the N64. You know, before polygonal games in general. But it had that sort of full 3D feel and look to it. It had sort of a, I don't know, I guess uh, an atmosphere I just got to confirm it. it is late 93, just so we don't get too right. overboard it's here. It's technically late 93. It came out close to Christmas 93, yeah, yeah. so it's it, 93, 94. I, th- I think it was going to be uh, released earlier, despite all the hype that John Romero built up for it. But uh, Well, I think, I forget when the shareware hit. I forget if it hit the same oh, time right, as the right. full release or not. And I should note, this game is very interesting because it's sort of a very early example of an indie game that would launch a company and turn them into a AAA sort of company. It was basically the prototype um, indie company. Like, you have all sorts of developers nowadays on Steam, but they were the first very prolific developer that didn't have, like, major company backing behind them. Uh, I, they, well, they, they did... They were uh, kind of an offshoot of Apogee, which was a big DOS developer. Yeah, uh, yeah, right, they, Softest, they, yeah Apogee, they came from those Softest, sort of companies. yeah. And uh, the, the guys, uh, the like, it, it was at some point just like a five or six man team, I believe. Of course, the two Johns, Romero and Carmack, were uh, leading them, and they did uh, attempt to levy for a partnership with Sierra at some point. But uh, I think Ken Williams was a bit of a dick to them, and then they just decided, uh, Ro- Romero chiefly decided, no, fuck that, we're doing this on our own. Uh, we're, we're going out on a limb, and we're going to make great games and distribute them how we want. And the gamble paid off, uh, certainly for Wolfenstein, which built up enough goodwill to, you know, build up enough uh, hype for Doom, and then that just... Why it, it just right. flipped it's, the world it's, on its, its crazy. head? It's crazy. It's it's absolutely insane because the the game was designed by like a small team of maybe ten people. I mean, that's in that sort of game of that sort of scale. I mean, that would be unheard of today to some degree. I mean, you see it sometimes, but and the programming of it was absolutely genius at the time. It was uh, it was extremely efficient. Uh, that's why it runs on everything these days. That's why you can run it on an ATM. You can well, run it on only, SL It's not only efficient; like it could run. I think I think you could maybe get it onto a 386, which was a lower end PC at the time. I believe you could get it onto a 386. I, I think it was built to run on everything because they wanted to right. sell it they wanted to sell it to everyone 
Uh, and it, it looked better than anything else as well. It just ran like a dream because of it, it's a 2D game that fakes you into believing that it's 3D, which is in, insane. If you played it, you wouldn't even notice it. Um, like, it, I mean, it, if, you, it, if you look at it like, uh, you know, they were releasing games in the um, what's the name? Build Engine, which I know the Build Engine is a better engine, uh, but, you know, visually... You had games that were coming out four or five years later, which were still not being considered like an unacceptable visual game that don't look much better than Doom. They might have more on the back end going, but but visually, this game was strong for like five years. Like there was no complaints about it at all. Right? Yeah. The um the other reason why it was ported to everything is because at some point. John Carmack released the source code. Like, Good Software released the source code and not just released it, they made it free um, he, under the GPL. Yeah. That's, he, that, there's a definition there. It's kind of it's kind of the, the legal concept, but if you wanted to and you knew how, you could take the engine and you could just port it. You could do whatever you want with it. You could make your own game with it. You could publish your own game on the engine if you wanted yeah, to. Yeah, so there were all kinds of games that were made on this that were distributed in, in, in software outlets at the time. I remember there being like um, like Simpsons Doom games and things like that, like unlicensed right, yes. Simpsons uh, Doom games actually sold in stores, like shareware discs and things like that. Um, we should also talk about how this game was distributed because um, by by today's standards, it's very odd. Yeah, um, I believe it did start out as shareware. I forget exactly through who licensed it. But then they eventually so, they, they eventually uh, got a contract with the GT Interactive to distribute it on CD, which was starting to sort of over. Take a floppy disk distribution by then. Um, yeah, so I'll explain it. I'll, I'll explain how it was originally distributed. It was a shareware game, um, much uh, in the line of uh, Wolfenstein 3D and uh, other uh, Apogee games at the time, like Commander Keem, where they would release um, the first episode, like the first third of a game uh, of the game free uh, to be downloaded off of the primitive internet at the time through BBS uh, BBSs and uh, bulletin boards and things like that. You would download it uh, if you had access to the internet at that time, which who, uh, only the biggest nerds of the nerds had this. And <laughs> and so they you, you would be able to download the first half of the game. So that's why like the first level of, of Doom, very much like the first level of Super Mario Brothers, is so iconic because everybody had it because it was free. Um, and, and just everybody played it. Uh, and y- you would get this game for free, and it was legal to have, have this game. And what you had to do in order to get the rest of the levels, I think there's 16 levels in all in the first game. Uh, there's 20 wait let's see okay so there's nine there's nine, three episodes 18. of nine levels 27 initially. yeah 27 originally. levels counting all the so, so the full ones, version yeah. you'd be getting around 16 more levels 18 more levels so what you would do is you would actually <laughs> you would either write the company and write them a check or, or give them a call they 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 would actually tell you the phone number of the company like a, a not even a toll free number like a, a number where you could call the company and and tell them to, like a major credit card over the phone and have them send it home to you. It wasn't sold in stores like that. And then later on, they had the shareware discs distributed in stores because it was so popular. People just wanted to buy the shareware episode. They wanted to buy something that was free, but they didn't have access to the Internet at the time. So uh, they allowed stores to sell discs of the shareware episode that's how my family got a hold of it um in the shareware keep in mind each episode at the time i think you could i don't think you could buy doom piecemeal some games you could buy it per episode and it would be cheaper so the original episode would have cost you about the first you know the first section maybe five to ten dollars which there are indie games that probably have less content than you know the original doom episode one that cost more than that um, because of the way it was distributed, it's very difficult to find an original box copy of Doom um, because you would have needed to order it specifically from id Software. So, like, and it doesn't have a UPC on it or anything because it wasn't sold in stores. So, um, it's and it's extremely was... hard to find because also, I mean, if you were outside of the U.S., because obviously you guys are all in the U.S., I yeah. mean, you had to pay a huge amount of shipping to id to get a copy of this outside of 
the U.S., I think they would charge an enormous shipping fee if you were, even if they even if they shipped. And I don't even know if they actually always did. Yeah, and um, I believe this is also the genesis of the um, the multiplayer uh, first person shooter. Is yes, that correct? This is one of the first exactly. multiplayer shooters, at least online, because I think before Doom there was MIDI Maze, but that used the MIDI port on the Atari ST to which is baseball, computers. right? Baseball, oh, yeah, baseball. yeah, MIDI Maze. Yeah, but this is the first game to have online multiplayer. Now, again, this is in '93 when the internet sort of barely existed. You know, it was kind of becoming a thing, and you could connect to someone. You know, usually it was college campuses. This is where the game was really yeah, you usually took land by storm. Um, it had co-op and deathmatch, I believe. I forget there were certain command lines you could um set to put the game in that mode. But another feature that's very interesting is that you can actually record yourself playing the game. They're known they're called demos. You know how most games of the time would have a quick demo that would show you the game being played right before you played it. Well Doom lets you record some of your own. You know, you could just you typed in a certain command and then it would record everything you did as inputs, which that causes that causes issues with later versions of the game because you know they might have changed how fast you moved or something. So one input may not work. It's very similar to how speed runs are done today or how um, inputs work on um, tool-assisted demos. It's very, very interesting. But a lot of modern speedrunning culture could possibly be traced back to Doom, which is fascinating and, when you think uh, about how big that is today. I, I also have to say that um, because uh, – and, and going in, in, in accordance with that – it is a, a game from the very beginning that was uh, encouraged you and and made it easy for you to make your own levels with it. Uh, they made it very easy for you to mod it and make your own levels and share them with people. They encouraged it. They loved it. And even packaged some of those levels eventually in Final Doom, um, which uh, is the third release, major release in the series. Um, so... Y- you had people that loved this game's mechanics and the way it worked so much that they made their own levels. Kind of like um, the only other game that I can think of before this that that people did this with uh, was um, what was a Baldur Dash. Baldur Dash had that. Load um, Runner as well. Those are Load Runner. You know, yeah, those sort of games. Yeah. Um, and yes, they designed it to be moddable from the start, and eventually people loved the game so much they figured out how to crack the format to not only build new levels, but also to insert new graphics, um, to even change how the game plays. Like There are some absolutely insane, um, what are known as, mo- or known as mod todays, but would have been known um, as partial conversions or total conversions at the time, one of which was uh, the infamous Aliens total conversion. Um that one basically turned Doom into Aliens, and it's absolutely wild. You can still find it out there today and play it. Um, eventually, they would try to follow that up with Aliens Quake, but I believe that one was uh, cease and desisted by Fox uh, itself and led to the term being uh, – to a mod being Foxed. That was the term for being cease and desisted huh. for a long time. Wow. I thought the Foxed. original um, Alien Doom was also – or Aliens Doom was also um, – I can't Eventually, remember if it was it's taken down. At least I think officially, it might have been. Yes, it was hard for it was hard for a while to find the absolute original version because that mod itself was so popular. It spawned sub mods. Other people were making mods of a mod for this game. You know, it, it's absolutely crazy the dedication people had to it. The guts of this game were so awesome and so popular that it 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 spawned a bunch of other classic games in its wake that used its engine. You have Doom and then like its its iterations like Ultimate Doom with all the different episodes. And then you have like Doom 2, uh, Final Doom, Heretic, Hexen, Strife, which is a, a, a proto game to like Deus Ex. Or, and then you have Chex Quest, like right? Chex Quest. You, 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 you had a ser- you had a cereal company that wanted to sell more boxes of cereal, so much so that they took the most popular PC game ever made and made their own kid friendly version of it and released it in their boxes of cereal. And it, it's an official Doom engine game. It's 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 licensed. Uh, and people still mod this game so much today to make it more fun, like Brutal Doom, um, just like playing around with the mechanics and stuff like that. It, it's it's such a cool thing that's happened with this game. And the thing about it, too, is that those mods, those mods that are still being made for Doom, um, 
Brutal Doom supposedly influenced some of modern Doom's design, Doom 2016. Like yeah, some of the, uh, the quick melee kills. It. Yeah, it's very much a descendant of it. Uh, um, on top of the mechanics and and level design and 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 guts of this game, I I have to mention how influential the style of the game. It's a it's a very much a hard rock game that is inspired a lot. Like it's a descendant of Rodney James Dio kind of shit from the <laughs> from from the seventies and early eighties. You know, the, this is like some heavy metal kind of stuff right here. You know, de- like fighting demons and and being the lone man against against a horde of demons on on phobos you know like and and fighting them with a chainsaw and god knows why you have a chainsaw on one of mars's moons you know with no trees around <laughs> i would like to apologize for getting a little bit quiet earlier but i was uh, pouring over a pdf file of uh, david kushner's book masters of doom which is essential reading if you're as much of a geek for this game as i am because it's all about it it's about the two johns and the people that they've met and recruited into the company and like their personalities and how much of it like shaped the Doom world. I mean, uh, well, it does have to be said that Doom's artistic direction is primarily the work of Adrian Carmack and Kevin Cloud. Uh, Adrian is, like, uh, he was a pretty dark and kind of troubled guy who had a lot of grisly ideas who, like... Well, he, he worked in a morgue or something, and he was, like, ah, 17 working right. in a morgue. <laughs> Mortuary something. He, he, was a, he was a morbid kid, to say the least, but, you know, that that influence really went into Doom's uh, design with all the bodies uh, like, gutted and strewn about everywhere, and all the heads on pikes and what have you. Uh, and, it, like... Uh, I just love how it starts out so technological in the first episode, and then gradually later on you see you know, m- more and more uh, disturbing and alien architectures. I mean, of course, you know, the first first level takes place on the moon of Phobos, uh, then the second level takes place on Deimos, which is floating above hell, and then the third episode is hell itself. And you right, sort of you descend the... from Deimos down into hell on like a rope or something. PCs at the time were a little actually behind consoles in a few ways in that it was very hard to make them do scrolling correctly, whereas the NES could do that. Yes, yes. Um, they, they actually had to program games really weirdly for DOS in order to make them scroll. And one of the very few games to actually have scrolling was, was like, you know, made by these guys. It was made by, uh, you know, it was Commander Keen. People take for granted these days that PCs are way more powerful than console hardware, but back then, they, they just worked differently. They weren't, PCs weren't made to do that kind of thing. Hey, back then, uh, in the 80s, uh, PCs were usually thought of uh, to mostly just be with, uh, like, uh, mostly just give you, like, adventure games and RPGs, you know, get games that aren't exactly, like, twitch reflexes. They move slow, they were for more uh, thinking of players, but, you know, we... Thinking of something that went at uh, warp speed, like uh, you know, like uh, Gyrus or uh, Thunder Fox. No, I don't know why I pulled it. Rolling Thunder. It, it'd be really difficult to fathom games like that uh, running on the PC. But Carmack saw it as a challenge, which he worked really stren- strenuously to try and overcome. And he eventually did figure it out and made his, and this it might be relevant later for the ranking, but he ma- uh, Carmack and Romero uh, worked to um, make their own version of Super Mario Bros. 3 for the PC, which yes. they actually wanted to pitch Danger to Nintendo. Dangerous and copyright infringement. I mean, there's there's more than we could ever say. Uh, Satenga mentioned the the Masters of Doom or whatever. Like that's mm. we're never gonna fit exactly <laughs> that whole book in there. Like there's a huge amount of all this game and everything that uh, it would do after as well. Like there's very few like design wise. There's very few games uh, in the first person genre that weren't at some point uh, owe something to Doom in a lot of ways. Like. Like, most games, even, like, Call of Duty and everything, is very much like Doom. 
it, it's it's they're very much like Doom games. There are very few games that stray at all, e- even in in the weapon loadout. You have shotguns, you have a chain gun, you have a machine gun, uh, rocket like, launcher, you know, uh, rocket launcher. You have you have a really big weapon. gun. <laughs> you have a really awesome melee weapon. Um, like e- e- even your melee weapon when you start in in Doom is awesome because you're just punching demons with with like brass knuckles which that is so badass with I, kevin I cloud's play. incredibly hairy arm as the model <laughs> he was the model for quite a few fps games by the way i believe he was up he was being the model up until shadow warrior or something nice it's crazy that guy's awesome um yeah i want to say that like a giant part of doom's success was really just through the guys behind it the two johns a carmax programming acumen and romero's amazing uh, Sort of attitude. Like he, he, yeah, he was the hype man for all of it, and just his enthusiasm for everything and promoting and playing the game as much as he did is genuinely childlike. Uh, the exuberance that he had for uh, you know his, his own products and uh, well, don't sell him short on his. Uh, Technical, I believe, like his yeah. ability to refine and design levels was, yeah, quite was high great up program. there. He was also, great yeah, program. really smart too. And uh, yeah, I mean, he, he really worked um, very well in tandem with Carmack to make the pushes ahead that he did. And he was always egging uh, Carmack on to do other things as he was, uh, you know, taking care of the actual levels. Like he really understood. Like he played so many video games himself that he knew what a good video game had to play like. And uh, the map design of Doom is is very much uh, impeccable due to his guidance. I, it's I hard not to talk about the whole game's legacy. Like, this game yeah. sets so much in stone. Um, it's one of the first games with online multiplayer, with Wango. sanctioned modding by the company. You know, with you know they released the level editor they used for the game, I believe. Uh, to give people the kind of idea what kind of runaway success this game was, it was on more computers than Windows 95 was. Um when Windows it's, it's an interesting bit of trivia, but it's always important to remember uh, that, that that's taken from when 95 just came out after Doom had been out for a while. Uh, it's a, that still tells you the sort of daunting task they had. Like One of I the mean, first things that um, Microsoft did was port Doom to the uh, Windows 95, wasn't and, it? Well, and it was programmed by Gabe Newell, by the way, uh, of Bell. It, it all connects wow. together, you know. Essentially, I, yeah, how do you how do you rank something like this that has this history that has this entire sort of mythos around it? It's a mythical game, like yeah, I mean it, it has so much well, story up behind it, and so many um, descendants, so many, so much of a legacy. It's such a tough game to talk about. I, I, I mean, s- the first question is is has Doom as a game been completely made irrelevant by everything that came after it like nope. has it no and because it's still it fun and, it, and it's good in its own right as well as um its descendants have been good i mean it, it it's a primal game kind of like robotron is or, or or super mario brothers one uh it, it's a game that defines everything after it and still is worth playing and that's the other thing. It holds up in such a way that Doom 16 was still pulling things from it, and it still feels fresh and relevant today. Mm-hmm. Like, a lot of the level design in that game is, like, pulled straight from the original. And then you have the snap map and stuff like that. It's just... Yeah, uh, every single weapon from the original Doom's arsenal is in the new Doom. O- only, like, two new ones were added. So, just, okay, okay. We're, so we're getting so let's go into the ranking here. Um, we How have to we... decide whether this is better or underneath Super Mario Brothers 3. I'm not going to say worse because that's that's ridiculous. Both of the games uh, d- deserve to their spot here. Um, Super Mario Brothers 3 is a an exemplary game, a, a game that people mod today still just as Doom 3. Yeah, people uh, in fact so much so that they made a, an entire official game built around modding Mar- Super Mario Brothers levels. Mario 3 and Doom have have a bit of a fight here and because when you go to pick a game to show to somebody who doesn't know what a video game is you would probably either pick Doom or Mario Brothers 3 <laughs> if if you went with that i would almost certainly say Super Mario Brothers 3 is going to win 
Um, if you just went purely by which game would you pick to show someone to explain what a game is, mostly just because I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't be like, okay, here's this well, super violent heavy metal thing that, you know, y- you know, people are gonna either some people are not gonna like Doom, you know, it it is slightly more specific than Super Mario Brothers, which I think is one of the most basic and approachable games ever. You know, like you run, you jump, most things make sense. And it doesn't have kind of weird little things like you haven't really mentioned any negatives on Doom. But I do think at times uh, you guys did go into the levels. And I think it's true that sometimes they can be a little bit more confusing to kind of deal with. You're like, oh, I'm lost. I'm actually lost. and I don't actually know where I'm going at this point. It does have an auto map, thankfully, something that their later games. Oh, yeah. That, that's have. something you forgot to mention. That, that was a feature. That it's a good auto map. Was, that that yeah, was missing. And they invented that. Yeah, it was missing yeah, and, in Wolfenstein and 3D, but in Doom, it was just so, so helpful to have that. It, it is important to, like, it's Doom is a great game, but I don't know if I would introduce it as someone's very, very first game, although that's what happened uh, back when it was brand new. I mean, uh, But at wh- the time, just its existence was amazingly impressive. I, I do think that compared to Super Mario and Mario Brothers 3 and those ones, I, I think Doom had a lot more of a hard time being as good as it is because you know in a lot of ways super mario brothers was refining and following on from what all the mario games and and other platformers did they had kind of a direction and they kept refining it and getting it right whereas doom has only a couple of kind of semi-immediate predecessors and doom is just like bam it's almost perfect get out of my way you know it's like (laughs) well okay i I agree entirely with cal on this uh by the way well, okay, if your argument, I guess, in that sense is that the Doom is already the pinnacle, you know, it can't get any better than that stifles conversation or, you know, however you want to phrase it in that case. If we're talking about what sort of game to introduce to a person, that very much depends because nowadays first-person shooters are one of the core genres. Super Mario Brothers 3 isn't really. Like, that's a good example of a classic game to me. And it's also a good example of a Nintendo game. But the problem with using something like Super Mario Brothers 3 as an introduction is that it's a Nintendo game. It gives you a good example of what Nintendo is all about in a lot of ways. But it's not necessarily a good indication of what video games as a whole are. It's, I guess, a better example of what they can be. So that's, that's, it's hard to say in that case. I mean, this was one of the first games that I fell in love with. I wouldn't say it was a full-on obsession, but I, it was one of the first games that really, really made me care about games in a way. It made me really double down onto like, um, you know, I started downloading other shareware games. It had a knock-on effect on that industry to get people to play games. Whereas Super Mario Brothers 3, that game is a phenomenon. I mean, it had an entire movie about how great it was, and you know, no one really, really watched it. Yeah, for it the- had a movie to about watching a bit of the game like that right <laughs> but it was all dedicated to how great this how mythical that game was and it's kind of funny to me in that in that respect doom and super mario are they're they're too too juggernaughty to be like this one is just better like i don't i you know, I, I i don't i'm not so sure because here's the thing about super mario brother say that a lot of people forget is that it was almost immediately superseded by Super Mario World, and I don't necessarily think Super Mario World's a better game, but when I people do. think of Mario, <laughs> well, a lot there, more that, people think that's of a World, huge debate. it seems like. No, that's a huge debate still even to this day whether 3 or World is better, and right, I, so you I, already I, I think it's problem. still 50-50. I, th- I still think it's 50-50, and I don't, I don't think you could say one is better than the other, to be honest. I mean, I, I, I think you could have a preference, but I think World and 3 are... Are, are so perfect on their own that it's really hard to pick, and that's why that argument still exists. Right. Um, There's one other aspect to consider, or to, that I actually consider with Doom 3, that would put it a little bit above Super Mario Brothers 3 to me, and it's that it's sort of almost, it's almost on the cusp of being something like Mario 64 or Quake, and the fact that it has that pseudo 3D environment, and how much that opened up and changed games. From that point on, I think there was an emphasis on 3D in games. Like, I wouldn't be sh- okay, when did um, Star Fox come out? Was that the same year as Doom? Or was that slightly after? Uh, that would have to be probably 93. Let me double check that. So that probably didn't have an influence on it, because again, uh, Doom uh, for the uh, SNES was yeah, super no, FX. Yeah, Star was Fox 19... should have been 93. It it's... was, yeah. And I guess so it... roughly, yeah, so that was Can right around the cusp Doom. of that sort of thing. Those two games, arguably, you know, were kind of the start of that, but um, 
that's the thing to me about Doom is that Doom is so ubiquitous you can put it on a toaster. You can't quite do that with Super Mario Brothers 3. It's not the game you're porting, it's the system. And the other thing about Super Mario Brothers 3 is it's sort of an iterative game. It's sort of building on its predecessors and it builds to a crescendo, whereas Doom is like, even when you consider its predecessors, it's it's like you said, it's the Super Mario Brothers of first-person shooter games. See, see I, I would say that that's the same argument. I would say that Mario Brothers 3 and Mario World do that to Mo- Super Mario Brothers 1. Uh, I, w- I would say that it's in the same wheelhouse. Well, I mean, what I'm hearing here, um, and I think it's a, it's a reasonable assessment, is uh, if we put Doom at the top, if we just go, okay, Doom goes to the top, we're going to revisit an argument like this at the very least – when we hit Super Mario World, when someone decides to... Super I don't know Mario if it's World or, that's Actually, good, probably that's Mario 64, thinking on Maybe, that's yeah. probably the next game. Yeah, At least uh, one of these the games is Doom. definitely... Doom is in a tentative top position because we know that there is a couple of games that are in a... Like these franchises, uh, you know, against each other here, where we know that it's probably going to oh. be another close fight. If I want to play a game, if I'm sitting down... And I'm like, okay, I'm I'm gonna go and play my one of my favorite games of all time. I'm gonna sit down and probably play Super Mario Brothers three. And my mom would play Super Brother Mario Brothers three with me, and she wouldn't play anything else. She wouldn't play Doom with me. Anybody can play Super Mario Brothers three. Anyone, and not everyone can play Doom. Um, it's it's m- more complicated because of the extra dimension. Uh, I I and and it's not as ubiquitous. I don't know. I don't know if the accessibility argument. Yeah, I, I mean, we have to decide to whether accessibility one. means that it can't. You know, like, is the best layman's game the top of the list, or are oh, we going so to go with? Obviously, we pushed deciding... the Ruger down for not being super one hundred percent accessible. I know that. Like, there there is a degree of accessibility, and I do think that Doom is in a comfortable position where it is accessible enough. You know, it. If you can get your head, because obviously Doom doesn't use a uh, two-hand control. Like it, it is like from a time before you had, you know, mouse-based shooting. Keyboard, you would have been using yeah. a keyboard or a gamepad. I actually played Doom on a gamepad for a while, a uh, PC gamepad, because it was you could, a game uh, set up the controls where you moved right around way. and you actually would hold a button to strafe. And I do also think, you know, because as you said, that Doom doesn't make you aim. Uh, up and down, you know, it automatically hits things. But I think, you know, that does make it more accessible. You don't have to do particularly precise aiming in Doom. It is very much 2D. It is about just looking and then sweeping side to side. You know, there's not a, you know, there's not too much to extra grappling around on. So I think it does, is it going to come down to whether we think accessibility is more important than well, that, that's being slightly all, better? That's all we have uh, in terms of doing a knock against it, either of these games, right? The, the, this is what we have to do. We're, 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 co- we're, we're comparing two of the best champagnes that you could drink, right? And and so you have to come up with something that makes it better than something else, <laughs> right? You know what I mean? Like, I, I, I can't do it any other way. I, 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 I can, yeah, I... I I, un- I understand the argument in that sense. I think I think we might have to settle this with a coin flip, I hate to say. Guys, uh, I anticipated this and actually brought a quarter from my own uh, jar of... My own change it, jar, as it were. It, it better not be a weighted quarter. It is an even quarter, right? Yeah, and, and wait, is, wait. With, this is not on camera, so you can really say whatever you want. I mean, really. Uh, well, I mean, <laughs> if I were to be the arbiter of this, I would automatically pick Doom, so I don't know if there's a better way to do this without yeah, that's making the thing. it seem like, rigged. Look, I'm we willing to trust you before. because, I mean, the integrity of this is very important. Um, I, and I, I'm, I'm not going to screw around with a giant decision like this. I, yeah, I, I have know. to play Go ahead. straight. Okay, Go well, ahead, who's going to... Uh, let's see. Uh, Satenga wants to put Doom on top, so someone else has to, to call the side who wants... Uh, I, think I, I, had to call. I, I think he'll be fair. Come on. <laughs> oh no! You got you, someone has to call the side when he flips it. You know that's the rules of a coin toss. Oh, all right. So you no, and that's... I are, are are on the side of Mario Brothers three, right? Is is that is that me me and Cal, uh, Visa Bold and Cal? I'm are strongly on the in side. favor of a coin toss. So yeah. <laughs> okay, and so uh, and and so Tenga and Snarbu are in the favor of Doom. Okay, uh, Cal, why don't you call it? And I am the furthest away, so Satenga, when you're ready, I will I will call heads or tails. All right, so I just do I just say like now as it's in the air? Or? 
Just tell me when you flip it, and I will say heads or tails. All right. Uh, I'll be calling it in that case. In fact, I'll count down to this. Five, All right, four, three, two, one, go. Tails. Fuck. I can never get these <laughs> throws right. But it landed tails on the floor. Ooh. That's it. So, so that's it. That's it late, though. As it lays. And it counts, it, as long as it spun in the air, which I assume it did. Um, so wait, Tails is face up or face down? So what are we looking at here? Uh, so, so so Mario Brothers wins, right? Uh, well, wait, what was... Uh, Cal, you were in favor of Mario Brothers 3? Yes, that would so be that. So you called it. I called so, it on, on Tails, so, and I was on the Super Mario side. Mm. I'm sorry, sir, but I think I really botched my flip. I've never well, been... Well, hey, hey, I, I, am, I am just the arbiter of the list here. I am the arbiter of the list. I have to go with whatever's decided upon here. So if the coin decided, let the, the record coin. show it's who scientific. is our number two game. I could have thrown it a lot game. better, and I feel ashamed at this, to be honest. No, no, so, okay. Tenga, this was a scientific yeah. Uh, yeah. endeavor, and it science decided. Does it mean Mario's won an extra coin toss? I don't know how many coin tosses this thing has Wait, won. Wait, should we have but... settled it that way? Should we do it best two out of three since it's already won a coin toss or something? I don't know. Um, <laughs> I think I'm we thinking... should, actually. We should let's flip a not, coin let's... in order to decide whether we flip more coins. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm willing to say, okay, so we've got one tail. I can go two out of three. I think that's fair. It's a very big decision. Let's not I'm leave it on one my coin. ground. Science Here. Can someone else flip the coin, though? Because I think I really botched yeah, it. Yeah, hand it to me, Satanga. Hand it to <laughs> me. Hey, I have a coin. Right, let me see. Let me see if I have a quarter. Okay. Okay, if you have a quarter, and then Vice we'll call it. We'll let Vice call it this time. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to count down, and when I say go, the coin is getting thrown. Okay. All right. One, two, three, go. Heads. It was heads. Oh, All right. well, it's already one. That. That's it. That's science. You know. That's well, cool. okay, I was fine with it before, but we'll, we'll, we'll do this again. Let the in a row. Go. I'm bringing the gavel down. Let the record show. Doom is our number two game. quite a discussion but unfortunately that's it for this episode of hardcore gaming 101's top games podcast special thanks goes out to at dot gobblers at jacko moran at gourd captain at solacirus and at m fedorowski for nominating these games and thanks to those of you who didn't get to yet we will be getting to you soon thanks as well to my lovely co-hosts and compatriots our editor jeff rudd our theme song composer, Muteki, and of course, the support and feedback of listeners like you. And don't forget, you can always support this podcast by making a small monthly donation at patreon.com slash hg101 and by following at hg underscore 101 and at gc9x on Twitter. But most importantly, help us claw our way into the zeitgeist by getting on iTunes, subscribing to HG101, and giving us a five-star review. Do it or... Xerxes will turn the entire outro into a freestyle white guy rap about his unsettling alt-right beliefs. Until next time, keep keeping it real. Keep keeping it real.